spray de oxitocina en, en las narices? ¿Qué tal si cambiamos nuestra forma de operar el cerebro con experimentos de testosterona? No les digo más, porque hoy vamos a hablar no solo del amor, sino de la confianza. Y un experto en neurociencias, un doctor en economía, un gran pensador que nos costó mucho trabajo traer, pero es un honor tenerlo en este auditorio, es Paul Sack, las moléculas de la emoción. Welcome, Paul. Pues es Puebla. I want to tell you a little story about a woman that I interviewed in the San Diego County Jail. Um, I'll call her Lisa. She was wearing an orange jumpsuit. Her hands and legs were shackled together. We're sitting in a room so small, my knees are almost touching her knees. Lisa was in her mid 40s. She had recently pled guilty to having a small amount of methamphetamine for sale. She was homeless. She supported herself by selling meth and using meth. This was her 12th or 13th conviction, and I was there to try to understand how she got where she was and how she might change. So we began this interview. When did you first start using marijuana? Age 13. When did you first start smoking methamphetamine? Age 13. Huh. I said, what happened in your family at age 13? And she said, oh, my mother was a meth user, and she wanted someone to party with, so she introduced me to meth. And then Lisa started to cry, and she said, and now when my mother calls me in prison and says I love you to me, I can't say it back to her. So breaking all appropriate clinical protocol, I said, I don't think you have to. Your mother did a terrible thing to you. Lisa had been raped because of meth. She had prostituted herself because of meth. She married a man who was a meth user who beat her regularly, once fracturing her skull and almost killing her. She had two teenage children who lived with relatives far away that she didn't see. So this story illustrates two important points. One, how is it possible for a mother to do something so terrible to a child, right? Children who we care about and love so much, how does that system fail? But more generally, why are we ever nice to anybody? Right, look at this nice audience. You great people here, you're having a great time. There's a couple of folks in the back who don't look so good, but everybody else looks really nice, right? And you're all having a wonderful time sitting next to strangers. How do we do that? So I spent 10 years in my laboratory and in the field running experiments to understand why we are moral, right? Why are we ever good to people? So I identified a molecule called oxytocin that before in humans was only known to be associated with birth and breastfeeding. It was thought as a reproductive system. But it turns out that we found the brain releases oxytocin into itself, into the brain. And when we release oxytocin in the brain, we are more trustworthy, more honest, more fair, more compassionate, more generous, more charitable. We express these moral behaviors. 
But wait, you say, how can that be? How can we study moral behaviors in a laboratory? So we're going to do a little experiment right here. All right? So imagine I have a big pile of money, and I can share it with you. We're going to split the theater in half. So people on my right, you folks have all given you 100 pesos. Here's your experiment. Don't let the other side hear you. Here's what you have to do. You have to decide, we're going to match you with someone on the left side of the theater, how much to offer of your 100 pesos to the other person. You'll do it on your cell phone. You can't talk to them. You can't see them. But here's the trick. If they like your offer, I'll pay you both. If they don't like your offer, all the money disappears. Now think about that for a second. How much money would you share with a stranger? Anybody? What would you do? 50%. So that's the most common offer is 50%. And it turns out that in, in uh, almost every country, 50% offers are always accepted. 100%. So we have a super generous person. So that's what we did next. We said, under what conditions would you give more than is required to have your offer accepted? So it turns out if I take synthetic oxytocin, shoot it up your nose, and it gets into your brain, offers are about 20% larger. Right? So you're going to give up 20 more pesos to this stranger you're interacting with by computer if I raise your oxytocin levels. And guess what? You're happier. Oh, we're going to torture you. By the way, we take a lot of blood in these experiments. We're doing all kinds of things, and we're paying you a little bit of money. And yet, if I raise your oxytocin levels, you're going to be much more generous. And in fact, I don't have to do it using uh, synthetic oxytocin. If I have you watch a sad movie that causes your brain to make oxytocin, same thing you'll be much more generous. It's the same thing for trust, same thing for compassion, same thing for charity. We've done these experiments over and over. Great, so we have an underlying biology of morality. But when does the system fail? Well, that's where the rubber hits the road, right? Guess when the system fails? Bad genes. We find that people who are diagnosed as psychopaths don't have this oxytocin response. They're in survival mode. They don't connect to other people. Sexual abuse, long-term sexual abuse, abandonment, neglect, this brain system that processes oxytocin that connects us to other people, and that's what oxytocin does, it connects us, shuts down. And excessive use of illegal drugs like methamphetamine and cocaine. Right? So if you use meth over and over and over, you burn out these, this brain system that for us makes it feel good to do good. So evolution has designed us with this system in which I do something nice for the humans around me, they smile, they laugh, they say, oh, he's a great guy. I want to be around him. Okay. Isn't that amazing? So if this system works, we need to encourage it. We need to exercise this system. We need to connect better to people. When we do that, we reduce our own cardiovascular stress, we improve our immune systems, and we connect better to people around us. Now, what we asked in experiments was, what's the subjective feeling of your brain releasing oxytocin? And it's one of empathy. So this is the little boy named Ben who's dying of brain cancer, and we showed a video of this, and people have a powerful reaction. They connect to Ben, they connect to his family. It's an awful thing to think of a child dying. And this sense of empathy is what makes us moral. It also is what sustains us in our social groups, right? When I share your emotions, then I'm also wanting to make you feel good, right? So it's these moral behaviors that sustain us as social creatures. That's very important. Now, you may say, hey, this is a big grand theory. Well, I have a whole book on this. You can knock yourself out and read it, tons of scientific publications. But let me show you one of the most interesting experiments I've run to test whether this result was, in fact, universal. Does everybody in the planet have this oxytocin system? That didn't work. Can you guys play the video? Let's see if we can play this. So this is an experiment that we ran in Papua New Guinea. And I ran it with uh, 20 men living in the rainforest who had actually never Sono seen Martin a doctor Art. or never been to a dentist. Oh oh so this is my village in Papua New Guinea. And these guys engage in these ritual dances they've done for thousands of years. 
And so I brought in generators and liquid nitrogen and blood tubes and centrifuges. And I took blood before and after this ritual to ask, does this ritual induce the release of oxytocin? And if it does, what's the behavioral effect? So this is an experiment. There's a technical word for this. The acronym is FUBAR. If you know what that means, you'll understand how bad this experiment went. Everything that could go wrong did go wrong. So I was embedded in this village for about a week. No electricity, no running water. You're kind of on your own. Not only did we find that for this ritual, oxytocin was released, I found that this experience was profoundly important to me personally. Once I was in this, this village, once I got to know these people, very quickly I felt great care for them, great love for them and them for me. And I called them my village. My chief has a cell phone, he calls me, it's so wonderful. Right? So even in this setting in which you have individuals who are isolated from most of the rest of the world, they have found a way to exercise this oxytocin system, connect to their communities, and when they do that, they reported, oh yeah, when I do this dance, I really feel like I'm part of the history of this village. I'm an important member of this community. And so I want to leave you with some ideas on how you too can build community. So what we found, what we report in the book, is that oxytocin generates this virtuous cycle in which as I release oxytocin, I feel empathy, when I'm empathic, I tend to behave in ways that are moral. One of those is trust. And it turns out that trust is among the strongest predictors economists have ever found to understand why countries are prosperous. When trust is high, we engage more in economic transactions, which reduce poverty. And as more people come out of poverty, they have the luxury of releasing oxytocin. Stress is an oxytocin inhibitor. It puts us in survival mode where we don't connect to other people. So once we start releasing oxytocin, it gets easier and easier to release it. We build a society which is more connected, more empathic. And in fact, that's what Lisa did. The prisoner Lisa finished her sentence and she went to the state in the Midwest where her children were living with relatives. She can't take care of them, but she's rebuilding her relationship with them, right? So if it works for her, it can work for any of us. And so, in fact, I've gotten this nickname, Dr. Love, because oxytocin is called the love molecule. It motivates us to care for our offspring, love our spouses. So let Dr. Love give you two suggestions today. Suggestion number one is that love is not some weird word that doesn't have a basis. Love is part of our evolutionarily old human nature. We are designed to be loving creatures. And the more we love, the more we can love. The second is, how do you do this? So we've shown in experiments, in fact, that you can increase the release of oxytocin through touch. So my prescription for you, as Dr. Love, is eight hugs a day. So while you're here, I see that the idea is, let's try to get eight hugs today. You'll start this virtuous cycle starting with oxytocin release. You're gonna be happier, the world around you will be happier, and you'll start this virtuous cycle in which we're building society like the kind that we want to live in. So I encourage you to try that today. Dr. Love says, have a wonderful day. Thank you so much.